Welcome everybody. My name is Katie Kaluzny. I'm the Associate Director at the Illinois Green Alliance, and we're so excited to welcome you to the fourth session of the 2021 Greenbelt Home Tour webinar series. Today we're going to talk about green home upgrades and have an Ask the Expert. Um, we have a bunch of special guests today that we're really excited to have. Um, but before we start, I'm going to just give you a few um, pointers about what's going on in the session. Um, first of all, if you're having any trouble or issues seeing me um, as the speaker, um, in the corner, or if you're having trouble seeing the full slide, um, you can join the Eventbrite um, through the Eventbrite Zoom window. You can also join the webinar directly um, by clicking on the um, link that was in the um, confirmation email, um, and it'll open up Zoom directly instead of through the Eventbrite. So that's one um, issue of, has some people have had in the past, just wanna let you know um, that's an option. Um, also, please make sure to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will have time for a lot of audience questions near the end of the webinar today. So please, as you're going out throughout, throughout today's session, if you hear something you're interested to learn more about, please feel free and put it in the chat. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the Illinois Green Alliance first. Uh, the Illinois, Illinois Green Alliance is a membership-driven nonprofit organization that advocates for green buildings and sustainable communities for all. Um, our recently launched five-year strategic plan um, pushes the green building industry to meet or get on the path to net zero. And we achieve our work through educational events such as panels and building tours like the session we're in today, engaging with communities and partnering with organizations across Illinois, and by advocating for new policies and legislation. Um, we're really excited to host the Greenbelt Home Tour again this year. Uh, the Greenbelt Home Tour began in 2013 by a group of volunteers passionate about green homes and increasing demand for high performance homes in Illinois um, through weekend tours, Q and A's with the home builders and builders, homeowners and builders and online resources, the Greenbelt Home Tour strives to make it accessible to see the benefits of the green home. Um, we started that program um, as an in-person um, tour where we were able to go to everybody's home and walk through. Um, as you know, the past couple of years, things have been a little bit different. So we were not walking through everybody's home um, when we switched to a virtual format to make sure that um, we're keeping everyone safe, but we're also able to share um, this great information and, and spread our education even further than people that might have been able to go to those homes in person. Um, and so um, we've hosted over 100 homes, featured over 100 homes since the beginning of this um, series back in 2013. So um, definitely check out our website at greenbelthometour.org to learn about past homes and the homes that we've been featuring this year on the series. Um, our last session in the series this year is next week on September 15th. Um, and it's going to be great with a lot of homeowners talking about things they're doing with, at their own home. So you can ask them some questions as well. I wanna thank our sponsors for this year's tour, um, the Chicago Association of Realtors, Mitsubishi Electric, um, ComEd Energy Efficiency Program, and People's Gas, North Star Gas um, Energy Efficiency Programs. And then also our partners for the tour this year, um, ISIF, uh, the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, AIA Illinois, uh, the Southwest Suburban Home Builders Association, Seven Generations Ahead, and Green Home Institute. Um, we've, we can't uh, make our reach without them, so really thank them for sharing the um, word about this event today. And then finally, um, this um, session is also um, qualified for AIA learning units, um, 1.5 hours. So the learning objectives for today's session are here. Um, if you need credit for your AIA, AIA credential, um, a Google form will be sent in the follow-up email and you can just provide your AIA number um, to receive credit um, for today's session. I think that's all of the logistics for today's session. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our moderator for today's session, um, Margaret Grasha. Uh, Margaret Grasha is the Associate Director of Research and Innovation at Elevate. Um, she's also an awesome member of Illinois Greens Programs Committee. Um, and we're really excited to have her here today um, as the moderator for today's session. Um, to introduce our speaker and lead us through our facilitated Q&A um, at the end of the session today. So thank you so much, Margaret, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Katie. It's great to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're so excited um, to have our experts here today. And the focus is really to answer all of your questions about where do I start? How do I approach things like my heating system, my electric panel? Um, if I'm thinking about converting um, to all electric. And I think the focus naturally tends to be on homeowners, people who own their own single family home, condo or building. 
Um, and that is our focus today, but we've asked all of our experts to also keep in mind renters um, when giving their answers. And I wanted to acknowledge just a couple of local efforts that are happening here in Chicago um, before we jump in. So one is the Chicago Building Decarb Working Group, um, which has been convened by Mayor Lightfoot to look at what should Chicago do on this topic in terms of actual policies um, that, that the city council could pass. Um, so I wanted to make folks aware of that and I'll drop a link in the chat to that. And in particular, there's a real focus on equity and how do we reach renters um, and people who might normally be left out of these conversations. Um, so we don't have that perspective represented here today, but I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot of good work um, being done by groups like Blacks and Green, um, the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization and many, many others um, in Chicago and beyond on some of those topics. So the agenda today here is that Sean Armstrong of Redwood Energy is going to go through um, an adapted electrification guide for Illinois. So we're really grateful to have his perspective here. Um, after he does that, we'll have each of our panelists introduce themselves just briefly. I'll get us warmed up with some questions that I've prepared. But as I said, we really want you all to ask questions and get them answered. Um, so at any point, please drop a question in the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get to it when we get to our discussion towards the end. And so with that, um, let me pass it over to Sean Armstrong. Sean, take it away. Thank you so much, Margaret. All right, here we go. Hey, y'all. It's great to be here. So, um, hey, not right now. I'm starting a presentation. Yes, you can. Of course, kids at home. Um, okay, I'm going to present on electrifying Illinois. So as a cleaner, safer, quieter, less expensive lifestyle. Um, here you can see all electric assemblage of stuff and go into some details here. Briefly, my background is I started studying all electric construction in 1995 at this demonstration house up in the right hand corner at Humboldt State University, which is the newest polytechnical of the CSU system. And I'm from Wisconsin. I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin, a vegetable farm among the many dairy farms. Then I was a science uh, teacher, high school science teacher for a few years. I started uh, working with an affordable housing developer doing the innovative zero net energy green building uh, work that, that was being funded by the USDA for rural areas where I lived at the time. <clears throat> and so I cut my teeth on doing real development for quite a few years. And since 2011, I've had a consultancy, I have staff, and we've been advising on all these small and large uh, zero net energy low income housing developments. So it mostly just affordable housing, low income housing just a few like market rate mansion-y kind of things here and there, but essentially just people have lost their homes in a fire. Those are the, the folks that um, we work with. Okay, so I'm gonna tell a little story first of all. Uh, this is Illinois, this is in Chicago um, in 1893, this photograph was taken. And uh, I wanted to sort of talk about the transition. And um, this is at a time in which Chicago is ready for a transition from horses. Uh, all across the United States, horses um, had, had an explosion. Uh, people wanted transportation, but uh, they didn't want to take care of horses, so they die on average after three years, an animal that could live for 30 years. And it was really the founding that ASPCA was an, an alternative to horses. In Chicago, right away, 1895, you get your first electric trolley. And then in 1973, that's your last electric trolley, that bus, quote unquote, down there, that's a trolley with uh, the electrical lines on it. In rural Illinois, um, started electrifying in 1935, um, assertively. Essentially, Chicago had been electrified around the turn of the last century, but nine out of 10 households in rural Illinois did not have electricity at that time by about 1935. So on the left-hand side, you can see what it used to be like to do your laundry before an uh, electric machine, laundry machine came through. Up top, you can see the Rural Electrification Administration, a depression era administration that lasted until 1959 that electrified Illinois. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that, that young farmer there. Um, he's delighted because he doesn't have to actually turn a crank to get his tractor anymore. He's got an electric battery. So he's got a, a hybrid, <laughs> a hybrid tractor. And that's his uh, battery charger up there. In the 1950s, uh, Illinois' Com Edison uh, funded a hit TV show. It was the number one show on Sunday nights, back when there was only two or three stations to tune into. And it was funded by all the electric utilities in the country, particularly Com Edison among the other Edison family uh, utilities. And uh, it was to sort of encourage people to add more electric loads. They were starting to build nuclear power plants. And the vision was that we're gonna have completely clean, nearly free energy from nuclear power in the future. So uh, they funded this theater show um, and all the stars from Hollywood would show up. And for half an hour, they'd do theater. Ronald Reagan would introduce it. 
And part of the job is he had a, this is his demonstration mansion. It was an all electric mansion, the Pacific Palisades. And then he opened up every single nuclear power plant in the country, including yours, which was only the third nuclear power plant that was built in the United States. And it's the first one that was privately funded. So you have that one, it's uh, like uh, Dexalon or something like that, number one, Dresden. I think it's Dresden number one, 1959, it opens up. I wanted to show you this cute little video that, uh, whoopsie. I'm gonna have to click on a share a different screen here. Pardon me for just a moment. I'll bring up um, Google Chrome. Go to this little thing. So this is a song called Little Bill. It's just halfway into this advertisement, but it's kind of adorable. So um, listen to this. You can't see it very clearly. I apologize. <laughs> promising little bills that was the um <laughs> that was what com edison did that ad specifically is their ad um my my partner michael he grew up in chicago i grew up like I said just up the road basically and um he told me about that just yesterday so i added it into the presentation so you guys could check that out there was a time in which com edison was aggressively trying to electrify all housing built in chicago they had a gold medallion program that they participated in nationally and here, um, part of it is that Chicago is also one of the first cities in the whole country to have a, a round trip flight to Hawaii, which was all built all electric. Waikiki and Honolulu, they had no fossil fuels. So people would fly out there where you know, it was uh, Elvis Presley's favorite go-to. He stayed every single time at the Hilton Waikiki, just like Paris Hilton and Britney Spears and such. And it's still a beautiful all electric hotel, just like almost the whole city. Uh, they recently, like in the seventies started adding uh, reprocessed gas, but it's expensive and not very available. So uh, the life of luxury is available to you just at the round trip flight from Chicago. Uh, but the dream kind of crashed 1973 nationwide, you know, lines around the corner. Uh, we were at peak oil in the United States. We had produced all that we could. And so we're dependent upon o OPEC. And, um, pardon me. Sorry. Um, so for 20 years, we stopped building all electric in the United States till 1993, and then we picked it back up. Um, in that period of time, there was homes like these, these demonstration houses around the country that were trying to teach how to, you know, power yourself with solar, wind, maybe biogas, but probably not. We experimented with that, made biodiesel, it really wasn't uh, safe or easy to do, and very little um, waste fuel was available. So these lovely demonstration houses, which uh, the one on the right exists to this day. That's where I got trained. But it really, it's been driven by the market nationwide. Check out Illinois. Uh, this is the Propane Education Research Council trying to identify why they're losing market share nationally. And so this uh, report that came out in 2016 studied the history of the previous six years. And they said, wow, nationwide, the market share gainer is electricity for fuel uses, like things like water heating and space heating, which is 90% of what houses use uh, fuel for, 90% of fuels consumed that way. So this is a national trend and it's led by the fact that all electric is cheaper to build, not by codes, not by policies. California has been at the very end. We've been the very worst over here. Uh, we were aggressively anti-electric because of the 2000 energy scam uh, when Enron and a few other different companies came in and. Uh, pretended like we didn't have gas available to power power plants and we're too dependent upon gas anyway. Anyway, our code sucks, but the rest of the country has been doing a fantastic job of electrifying. It's just cheaper to build. On the left-hand side, you can see here, if you're putting in a furnace or an air conditioner, you can spend one to $3,000 more than putting in the heat pump air conditioner. Uh, the water heaters are cost neutral. Dryers cost more if they're electric. You can just check it out yourself. Uh, stoves, same thing. They're, they're about $100 more for the exact same brand, the exact same model, everything the exact same. It's just gas versus electric because they make these exact same boxes and the gas is always more expensive. It costs more to, to build with gas plumbing than with wiring. 
and then $200 to $1,000 per fixture to run wiring, and then $16,000 to get a line extension from the street. And then if you're doing a subdivision, it's another $140 a linear foot, up to 3,700 if it's like uphills and around complications. And then all the stuff on the right, this is what makes gas expensive, which is the infrastructure. If we stop building with gas, that's about 80% of the revenue of gas companies is new infrastructure. And that causes an almost immediate drop in their valuation if they're no longer building new things, which is what we need, an honest accounting of the fact that we can't continue to burn gas. This infrastructure is not valuable to us for the next 40 years. It's valuable for the next five years, 10 years, but not 40. It's also cheaper to operate in Illinois, uh, all electrically. If you're using heat pumps, you're gonna have a, like for the water heater, a bill of $161 versus $231 for the very best, best gas uh, water heater that you could buy. Of the same capacity and such. Sorry, my seven year old is being a seven year old. Um, so it's just cheaper. Uh, this is assuming, I think, 12 cents a kilowatt hour on the left. You guys have, I think, 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and this is a dollar or nine a therm. Um, you have more expensive natural gas than a dollar or nine a therm. So these are pretty accurate. I check to make sure uh, to your actual Illinois bills that you get. It's also a dramatic reduction of greenhouse gas pollution to go electric. Um, some states like yours, you are like at 62% renewable energy in your grid if you count nuclear. But it's certainly decarbonized and clean in that way. So even an electric resistance device in, in, in Illinois is a decarbonization move. But getting heat pumps is dramatically better because you're just gathering energy from the environment. The heat pump makes a cold surface in the winter time. It air conditions essentially um, the air outside, it chills the air, but that pulls heat inside your house. So it is gathering existing heat from the outside environment and it uses maybe one unit of electricity heat to get three or four or even five. Some of the best heat pumps over in Japan get seven units of heat in for one unit that you've used. So it is a dramatic move in reducing greenhouse gas pollution, no matter what state you're in, what grid dirtiness you have. It's always an improvement to use a heat pump. So this has become national policy. I'm about to switch into your home recommendations, but I just want to know that this is uh, the clean energy movement that, and that's what they called it in the fifties when it was becoming nuclear power, it's supposed to be clean energy and still the clean energy movement to use um, decarbonized, not fossil fuel burning devices on the grid side to deliver clean electricity to your house and use efficiency on like heat pumps, which they were selling in the 1950s. So now <clears throat> I wanna familiarize you with this resource we're gonna dig into. And now you get sort of the history. This is a good move right now for you in Illinois. This is how you do it. Um, this is a book that we wrote. It was a nationally resourced book. So we consulted all across like the cold states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, as well as like cold climate in California. Up in the mountains, it gets cold. Uh, these are folks that have done it. This is the booklet, A Pocket Guide to All Electric Retrofits of Single Family Homes, which is at this website, our research website, redwoodenergy.net backslash research. And there's a book there for single family retrofits, single family new construction, commercial new construction, multifamily new construction. Uh, so that you have a lot of resources there. To start off, this is a range of costs. These are 10 different homes in Ohio that got electrified by um, Energy Smart Ohio, Nate the House Whisperer, you can find them on Facebook. And so you can see in blue, this is the HVAC costs. So this is coming into a ducted house and putting in another ducted heat pump, that's the blue. So it's about 10 grand, nine grand, 12 grand. Then in orange, that's duct work. Sometimes you have to fix the duct work. It's so broken, you'd wanna fix it. So some people got their ductwork fixed in orange, some people didn't. Um, in yellow, that's the hot water heater. Uh, so not very expensive, few grand. You know, it's like $1,200 to buy and it's some amount of money to install depending upon your plumber. And uh, then there's some project management, that's Nate's cost. I think he's like three or four grand per house that he comes in on. And the range then, well, this one's a small project management, but the total cost there, that was about 11 grand. And that's a small house, smallish, 1,600 square feet. And then this 2,700 square foot house, it's the most expensive, 49,700. And the reason why is the gray box. That's him making it more comfortable. That's all the insulation and the weather tightness 
it's for people to feel comfortable finally. He just asks them what rooms are uncomfortable and what should we do to fix them? And he's not selling energy efficiency or decarbonization. He's just selling comfort. He's, he's quite clear that that's the way that um, it's his wise business move. That's what people want to talk about. So this is the more comfortable way to live in. Um, it's also quieter. Heat pumps are much quieter than furnaces when they're heating. So you can sleep through a heat pump because it just operates quietly all night. That turns on and off three times to eight times an hour like furnaces do, it's annoying. So I wanna talk about the things you're probably interested in like cooking. Um, it, cooking on induction is way more fun and faster and easier and cleaner than cooking on gas. I've been a cook my whole life. I've worked in cafeterias and restaurants, the whole bit. I'm a cook. And I had gas stoves until I put a two, bur two burner induction range next to my nice big gas stove. And I was like, I don't need to cook on my gas stove anymore. This is way faster, easier, et cetera. And I could let my kids on it because the number one source of formaldehyde in your house is the gas burning on your stove. It's not vented. And that's what is the byproduct of burning natural gas is this heavy duty carcinogen. And it causes leukemia in kids. It's well documented, causes leukemia in kids, causes leukemia in pets. This is a, a, a gas that's heavier than air. So it, it puddles around you, causes smog-like conditions in kitchens to um, conditions to have a gas stove on. When the sun comes through the window, uh, the amount of nitrogen dioxide that's coming off your gas stove is just like next to a highway. So it is essentially the dirtiest air you'll breathe in your life unless you work in an industrial facility. And at that point, the air that you're breathing in your kitchen is illegal in an industrial site. So you'd be in non-compliance if you're at a gas plant smelling what happens in everyone's kitchen when you cook. It's that bad. So Taylor Swift here dancing around on induction. It's the thing to do. All the fancy restaurants, Alinea, if you want to go downtown, that really fancy three Michelin star restaurant, all electric kitchen, so they can do all their fancy things. Um, but just for you, modest person, on the left-hand side, if you're taking my advice, get stop using your gas stove today. Go get a drink pod true induction, $140, just it's like a simple appliance, you plug it in, you can get cooking done. It's my favorite, I've tested a bunch of them because it's quiet. It's not actually the highest power one, but I really appreciate quiet things and I don't like loud beeps. Um, this is my oven, this Oster here, does everything. We're a ranch, I, I have like cattle and turkeys and all the rest of it, this oven's great. But these are the kind of normal ones on the right hand side. Um, $500 ones is for standard rentals for affordable housing. And then you see single family homes generally, they start spending a thousand to 2000 on their induction ranges. The ones up here are resistance, smooth top, which is nicer and easier to clean. And then down here is the fancy ones, you know, uh, where you're gonna spend 2000, 3000, you wanna spend 20,000 um, and you can get it looking like it's from any era. Uh, fun story, the AGA on the far right hand side, that guy, he founded it around 1920 because um, he had a fossil fuel explosion in his face. He was a chemist and he, he was blinded. And so he um, was so traumatized that he invented an electric stove that he then marketed, but it was for his wife so that she would, would never get injured like what had just happened to him. Here, I, I wanna give you a, a, like a little lesson, just so you know, the kind of the easiest, best thing to do if you wanna put in an electric car charger is to use the plug use a 120 volt plug near it for a condensing washer dryer. So these things, they take almost no energy. They're using a heat pump inside and they're wired specifically so you can plug them into any outlet as long as you got a little sewer line and it doesn't need a vent because it's condensing. It doesn't exhaust the air, it just squeezes moisture out of the air and then dribbles it down a pipe. So this is my washer dryer, way better experience than the alternative, love it. And I now have a big 240 volt plug next to it that I can use for my, my electric vehicle charger. I'm actually just doing trickle charging with my electric vehicle. I don't drive that much, but um, if I wanted to do a fast charger, that would be the available plug. This is what you might use for space heating. On the left-hand side, these are like little ones. So you'd use those uh, where you'd have one fan coil on a wall, or maybe in the ceiling per room. The ones on the right here, these are for ducted systems. And I, I'm showing these all because they're for negative 31 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, negative 15, negative 13, negative 22. These are the ones that can survive your polar vortexes without noticing, without even electric resistance backup. This Mr. Cool here, this, um, there's a cool video online of them operating all night at negative 24 in North Dakota. 
and um, in an old 1940s house with just a little insulation and old doctor work. Didn't have to do anything to it and maintained it at 70 degrees Fahrenheit at negative 24 outside. So Mr. Cool definitely gets the job done. Um, you see LG, there's others, but these are the ones I wanted you to, to note. Here are the more standard American form factor, the block type. And um, unfortunately, they're not making them quite as cold as the Eurasian type, the ones you see in, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Don't know why. But um, these ones, they sometimes want to sell them with electric resistance backup, which is an expensive um, way to do it, both on a utility bill and also when you have to install more electricity to your house to support it. So I encourage people to go with heat pumps that are designed for the coldest weather. Um, although I know people are running the carrier at, during polar vortexes without electric resistance and it's working fine in Ohio. So I don't think it's necessary, but some thoughts there. Ground source heat pumps, way more expensive, triple your budget, um, but they also work at any temperature outside and they're very efficient and they're appropriate for hydronic floors mostly, that's how people use them. Um, so they get the heat out of the ground and then they stick it into pipes in the floor, which is very expensive, but it's very nice. Um, these heat pumps below, these are air to water heat pumps that you do the same thing, like hydronic floors or maybe duct work or radiators, et cetera, um, that you can set up with these. Some radiators need to go to high temperatures. So brands like Yaga, J-A-G-A, they go down to like 80 degrees Fahrenheit and they'll produce heat. The, the temperature of the water coming in or 120 Fahrenheit. So um, radiators, sometimes want to, you want to partner them up with the right heat pump so that you get the right temperatures, but that's what professionals do. Just want you to know that it's totally possible. If you have radiators, you can get a heat pump that meets your radiator needs. So here's a range of efficiencies. On the left-hand side, this is the federal minimum efficiency. So it's heating is an 8.2 and it's air conditioning is 14. As the numbers get bigger, that's better, more efficient. So the best products you can get in the United States right now are around here. So they're using half as much energy for air conditioning, twice as efficient, half as much energy, almost twice as efficient as the lowest um, on the left-hand side there. So that's about half as much energy and that's important. Like it, it reduces utility bills. It also can reduce the amount of power that you need from your service. So you don't have to put in as much um, electrical supply to your house potentially. So it saves money to go with higher efficient equipment usually. Here's pretty fireplaces. You know, I grew up on wood stoves, just constantly all winter long shoveling wood into a fire. And these look just like fire. Um, these mist based stoves by Optimist. Um, you, you put your hand into it and you think you're gonna catch on fire but it's just mist lit, lit with LEDs. And so it's way cheaper to install because you don't need to put a chimney up with that's the double wall, like with wood stoves or for that matter, gas stoves. It's just water vapor and it's not even hot. And you can get ones with electric resistance elements below. So you get warm heat coming off of it like it's a stove. If you're, so if it's aesthetic, they make aesthetic only. And if it's for heating also, great aesthetics plus heat. Um, and it's cheaper to install than a gas stove or a wood stove. Water heaters. Um, on the left hand side, this is kind of the Japanese sitting tub style. So, if you got a big tub, you want to get an Eco 2. Um, they're designed because in Japan, that's tradition. You take a shower and then you take a 150 gallon sitting tub, and multiple family members take this big, it's like a hot tub basically. You take turns, or you know, maybe it's two people in the hot tub. Um, so, that's how they, they bathe, and they have these big heat pumps for water heating. These ones on the right, these all have one fourth the, the heating capacity, but this is standard American showering heat pumps, showers and bathtubs, you know, 40 gallon bathtubs, not 150 gallon bathtubs. So that's the, the ones on the right. And you can put them anywhere where your gas water heater is now. Like if the pipes are freeze protected, wherever that gas water heater is, you can put a heat pump water heater. It's okay to put them inside buildings. It's okay to have them inside a closet. Um, it's better to vent them. You don't have to, but it's definitely better to vent them. They come with vent kits. So you can do it. All the national labs have recommended it. We're doing it in apartment complexes. They're small. Just put the water heater in the apartment. This would have cost a retrofit though. And this is all in. So everything, the condensate pipe, the new wiring, everything you might need. You know, the purchase price for the heat pump is $1,100 to $1,300 for a 50 gallon. The all in construction price, the average ranges from 35 to 45 over the course of the few years that they did this. Noting that they had they were giving it an incentive of three thousand dollars, so 
3000 out of $3,500, some of the plumbers are like, you know, I'm going to charge $4,500. And so when SMUD lowered the rebate, prices also dropped. <laughs> so it's fair, it's fair to think it should be $3,500 to retrofit a heat pump water heater on average. And it can be lower. It could be 3000 It could be 2800 be 2400 I had a plumber who's willing to do it for 2400 Here's your outdoor entertainment. Here's heated tables and outside lights. So you can stand outside and party in the spring or the fall. Um, here's your barbecues. Um, keep in mind, every boat always has an electric barbecue because you can't have open flames on a boat. So there's tons of maritime barbecues. And there's also lots of backyard stuff. You know, Weber makes a plug-in electric grill. So any grilling you want to do, electric is great. Any smoking you want to do, like smoked meats. Resiliency. What do you do when the power goes out? Because, man, it's, you want to have power for everything. Even if you haven't electrified your house a bit, you still can't get your fridge to work. The things that you need, like, you know, instead of winding the clock back to 1935, where, you know, people were just getting ice out of the closet, because, you know, all the crazy old school stuff, like people want electricity. So, from left to right is the smallest of these little batteries that will take a solar panel. You can get a solar panel and plug it into this thing and you've got power. So for 120 volt, for cell phones, et cetera, it's designed, all these are designed to just take any old solar panel and just pop it in. Don't just put it out on the ground, you know? Um, goal zero is the biggest one. This is about half of a Tesla Powerwall's worth of, of electricity at five grand. And Tesla Powerwall's cost about 10 grand. So it's all, scaled there but tesla power walls you can't just roll up you know that's a whole process this you can just purchase and plug panels into the side of it and no permits no nothing just backyard survival but it gets better next year the ford f-115 lightning this thing has 170 kilowatt hour battery in it so that's easily a week you know if you're even being a tiny bit frugal and if you've got a solar array up on the roof you can literally go forever this thing's at huge storage it could go drive someplace and power itself up, which is what they've been doing in Japan since Nissan started this in 2011 at a commercial scale. When they've had large power outages, people have driven to Nissan charging stations outside of the territory of the power outage, powered up, brought it home. So the equivalent of that is going to the gas station to get gas for your generator, except there's often lines and frequently the pumps run out of gas and there's issues with that. Um, this is like this resiliency, you got your truck and it's set up to power your house. And all these down here, Wallbox, Asiaco, Nuve, Fermata, these are all products that are coming out this year and next year to do the same thing. And it's all over Eurasia and it has been for more than a decade, but now it's finally coming to the US where we can take electric vehicles and plug it into the house or plug it into the grid and, and sell electricity to the grid. Volkswagen, <clears throat> standard issue on all of their vehicles, all their EVs coming out is gonna be vehicle to building, vehicle to grid. Okay, now the last thing, I want you guys to capture is you don't need to do a service upgrade. You may want to, but you don't need to. I wanted to give you a couple strategies so you don't have to pay for that $2,000 to $6,000 expense of delivering twice as much power to your house. Twice as much power means going from a 100 amp panel, 2,400 watts, 24,000 watts, pardon me, to a 200 amp panel, which is 48,000 watts of instantaneous power. How much can you get through without melting the wires? So you've got options. On the left-hand side, this is a power balancing circuit breaker panel. So you can plug in 200 amps worth of stuff, but it won't use more than 100 amps. And it will balance power around until it gets the 100 amps. And that means you might shut off your electric vehicle charger for half an hour while your dryer is going. You know, you might have your water heater turn off for literally 15 minutes while you're cooking, because most people don't cook longer than 15 minutes. So these kinds of things that the span is designed to do, both off-grid and on-grid, importantly, so that you can electrify now with a new circuit breaker panel, but not a new service wire from the street in Palm Edison, or the rural electric utilities, which are the vast majority of your state are rural electric utilities. On the right-hand side, this is called NeoCharge. There's also a dryer buddy, there's Simple Switch, there's Thermalec, there's a bunch of them. They're just 240 volt plug strips. You just plug two, 240 volt appliances into one box, UL listed, plug that into your 240 volt dryer plug or stove plug. And now it's powering two devices without having to rewire. Um, it's really low drama. They're like 250 to $500. So 
So that's a lot cheaper than even running a new wire to the spot. Um, and it's a lot cheaper than every stage of circuit breaker panel upgrade, service upgrade, just get one of these plugs. Here we have cutting costs with power efficiency. I realize this is kind of big, but what I'm trying to show you is that the space heating here, there are options that use less power, like a portable heat pump by to Toshiba versus more power, like getting a big heat pump for ducted systems and electric resistance backing it up. These are all in watts. I said, you know, your 100 amp panel is 24,000 watts. And this is also in rated watts. So we've derated it according to the code. So this is what actually shows up on your panel. This is all in that booklet I showed you, just to remind you that there's like longer explanations, lots more graphs, lots more discussion. I'm just trying to get you into the mix. So there's options for water heaters. There's lots of options for cooking, different ways you can you reduce the amount of power that you need for your kitchen while still getting all the same services. Laundry, like the condensing washer dryer, like has no impact on the circuit breaker panel, um, whereas the heat pump dryer does. Uh, electric vehicle chargers, a lot of different charging equipment out there. And this is what it shows like to have um, the, the 240 volt plugs. It's a negative, like you, you can actually save power that way because you're sharing it from two devices. So that's the negative 2000 there. This on the left hand side is what a panel would look like if you had a 3000 square foot home and you wanted to do it on a 100 amp panel. This is all the code required normal stuff. And in green is the place where things are being changed. And so we have one of these 240 volt plug strips for the heat pump water heater and a resistance dryer, just standard resistance. And then we have another one of these 240 volt plug strips, this NeoCharge or others. Um, and you've got your stove and your EV charger. Over here, you can still put solar on. You can do um, about four kilowatts of solar on the roof this way. And then you put in a ductless heat pump because duct work takes more fan energy. So ductless heat pump, that's how it got done. And that's it. I'm gonna pause and, and um, let my co-presenters, you know, take over the stage, but I have, I'm gonna go into the chat. And Margaret, thank you so much. Thanks, Sean, so fascinating. Thanks so much. I'm gonna ask our other panelists to come on camera. Um, there've been some really good questions in the chat. Um, Sean, maybe one you can answer just while we're all coming back on is, are there heat pump electric fireplaces or only resistance heat fireplaces? Right now, only resistance. It's kind of a, it's a luxury toy kind of device anyway for most people's homes to have a fireplace. I'm not talking in the rural areas, but most people's homes. So yeah, that no one's invested in a heat pump version of it yet, but you hardly ever use it, so yeah. Thanks, yeah. All right, um, so let's see. We're gonna have our uh, panelists introduce themselves. We'll start uh, with Graham from Eco Achievers. Um, then we'll have uh, Bob and Joe from IBEW. Just give quick two to three minute intros. And then Mike of Coppice Heating and Air. And then I have a couple of questions prepared um, that we'll start with. So with that, Graham, are you ready to give a quick introduction? Sure. Thanks a lot, Margaret. Uh, my name is Graham Giovanoli. I work for a company called Eco Achievers. We're based in Chicago. Um, I'm the partner and building diagnostics manager. Uh, and we specialize in green building certifications and consulting. So essentially high performance buildings. Uh, a lot of what Sean was talking about might make their way into the buildings that we do work on, uh, either uh, because they're getting a rating uh, all the way up to Passive House, Energy Star, or some type of uh, green certification. Um, I also spent a lot of time in weatherization, so crawling around in attics. Um, that's the other piece of this. So uh, typically when we think of electrification, a lot of people skip to the end, which is the sexy side, the renewable energy side, the solar side. But I like to put it like this. First, you have to lose the weight before you put on the swimsuit. So that's the, the unsexy stuff, the weatherization side. So I'm here to kind of uh, help with that, that area. Great, thanks, Graham. Um, Joe and then Bob. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Kilcoyne. I am a business representative for Local 134. And I also serve as the treasurer and a trainer for the Illinois IBEW Renewable Energy Fund. For anyone out there who doesn't know, IBEW is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So uh, Bob will speak a little bit more about the Renewable Energy Fund specifically. 
but we do a lot of training around the renewable energy sector and uh, that field in construction. And uh, moving towards that, just uh, to echo some of the other thoughts on efficiency, moving towards efficiency first, examining all those um, places that we can improve our, our um, energy usage prior to going to solar or energy storage is something that we, we talk a lot about in our trainings. But I'm uh, very happy to be here tonight and uh, look forward to the questions and I'll pass it back to Margaret. Bob, take it away with your intro. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, my name is Bob Hattie. I'm also a business representative for IBW Local 134 here in Chicago and focused primarily in the renewable energy, energy efficiency, energy storage uh, space within the electrical industry. Um, as Joe mentioned too, I'm, I'm the executive director of the Illinois IBW Renewable Energy Fund, which is our statewide training initiative uh, where we work with all IBW locals in the state, high schools, community colleges, um, this is a, a FIJA funded workforce development program. Um, we also work with electrical inspectors and firefighters on safety issues around renewable energy. Um, and again, I, I also want to second what, what Graham said there. We do have to start with efficiency first. So I think it's great that that's going to be the, the, the focus of this conversation. Um, but there, there is definitely a lot of things we can do once that those efficient measures have been taken to make this uh, more feasible. Great. Thanks, Bob. Mike, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me out here, Margaret. Uh, my name is Mike Anderson with Compass Heating and Air. Uh, we do a lot, mostly residential um, retrofits for the most part. Uh, we've done a few uh, new home builds as well, custom homes. And uh, it really what got us into the uh, idea of electrification was some of the homes that we were working on uh, several years ago. It was pretty amazing uh, how well the systems uh, all come together. It was pretty, pretty nice. Now we've done several of the ductless systems as well as combinations of ductless and and uh, and ducted, and it really has done a pretty phenomenal job. Great, Mike. So let's start with efficiency first, since several of you have mentioned that. So I think um, my first question will go to Graham, which is just where should people start given. Um, the available programs um, and rebates that might be out there for efficiency and weatherization. We also had a question come in from Karen and that I, I think was specific to her home about having brick veneer on concrete masonry walls. But in general, you know, they're going to be homes that have really different um, acceptability for things like insulation. And so, Graham, if you could just talk a little bit about you know, different approaches if you can't do sidewall insulation, for example, or, or things like that. Just where should folks start when they're thinking about efficiency? Sure. Um, the first thing to do would be to take inventory of your house, you know, what exists. So I like to tell everybody first to buy a kilowatt meter if they don't already have one and start to look at what the loads are on your different appliances and systems. If it plugs into the wall or it has a switch, then it's going to use electricity. So you want to kind of start to inventory that. Um, see if you have really large offenders, see if you have some vampire loads, things that are sucking energy that when they're off and they're actually on standby. Um, you also want to look at you, your utility bills if you're seeing spikes. Maybe you've noticed that that um, dehumidifier in the basement is using a lot more power than you thought it was. And there might be another alternative like a whole house dehumidifier, another strategy that you would look at using. Um, the next step would be to get some professional help. So uh, there are trade allies with the utility companies that you can call uh, and they're, they're registered trade allies. So they're certified and they can come out and give you a um, kind of a rundown of what's in the house and what kind of air seal and insulation measures uh, would be a good idea to start with. There's also a lot of DIY things that you can do. Um, first, thing that you should do in the house, no matter what, is take all of your light bulbs, examine them and switch them out to LED. There's no excuse for having anything other than LED in the house at this point. Um, you can get any color range, uh, you can get any temperature. Um, the, the, the technology has advanced to the point where we should, we should be using LEDs. Um, other than calling the trade allies, you can also call an independent third party firm that can do a full energy audit for you. And that might range anywhere from four, uh, $500 to $700, depending on the size of your home. And they can do a, 
a really in-depth analysis of your mechanical system and your insulation levels uh, and all of the components of your home that use energy and talk to you about how it's being used and how it's staying in the home and how you can better that. Um, things you can do yourself other than light bulbs or weather stripping at the doors and windows, adjust your window latches. Um, and then you, if depending on your comfortability, you can grab a froth pack or some foam and some caulk and you can do your own air sealing. Uh, warm air rises, uh, it's called stack effect. So you're gonna start in the attic and seal up all the holes. Uh, and then you're gonna move to the basement. That's the second place you're gonna go. You're gonna look for penetrations. And when it's, there's a big temperature difference between the inside of the house and the outside of the house, you can feel the air coming in. Uh, depending on if you're in the summer or the winter. Uh, so you're gonna look for those places and you're gonna start sealing stuff up. And then ultimately I would be remiss if I didn't mention the blower door, the big red door of truth. So at some point you're gonna to wanna to get a blower door test, which is testing the air tightness of the home to find out exactly how tight it is. Because again, uh, moisture and heat and uh, as a result, energy moves in that medium air. So if you're keeping the air in the house, you're keeping the moisture and the energy and the heat in the house. And then you can think about solar. Thanks, Graham. Does anybody else on the panel want to talk about the first step or add anything to what Graham just said? Yeah, I would just like to add a couple other things to keep in mind <clears throat> beyond uh, your lighting source itself is looking in the lighting controls. You can get you know, occupancy sensors, timers, things that can help you uh, use less energy with your lighting and um, any other electrical appliance um, would be one thing. But really paying attention to how you use energy is really the, the, what I can recommend the most is don't just assume the bill comes, we pay it and we forget about it. Really pay attention. The suggestion Graham had about a kilowatt meter, the first time you plug one of those in and you really see how much energy a lot of our appliances use in the off position, it really opens your eyes to uh, how we can really make some improvements here. Uh, a, a power strip can go a long way, kind of like what Sean was talking about for sharing the, uh, um, the dryer with the electric vehicle charger, but even just putting your TV and all the, your computers and all the other peripherals on a power strip and turning it off can make a major difference. So there are some very affordable energy efficient options that we can start with. Um, the one thing I do want to mention about weatherization though, um, there are things that we can all do to seal our envelope, but we do have to keep in mind the indoor air quality. So you don't want to completely seal your envelope unless you know that your HVAC system has the appropriate amount of fresh air coming into the home. Thanks. And loading priority. I think that people should get rid of their gas stoves first, which is the like the largest source of indoor air pollution. And it, it's like something that it triples the heart attack medication that people have to take if they have a heart strain. You know, it's causing somewhere between 12 and 25% of asthma in kids, according to multiple different studies. So I'd start there with um, prioritizing get rid of your, getting rid of your gas stove. It's the easiest, cheapest one of all the different gas using appliances to get rid of. Thanks. I want to I want to switch gears a little bit and bring in Mike. Um, I think a lot of people in our climate, their first question is sort of like, what what will my first winter be like? What will comfort be like? Mike, you mentioned you've been impressed with the performance of some heat pump systems that you've installed. So can you just talk a little bit about what is that like? You know, I think folks might be used to the blast of warm air from a furnace. Um, what what is a heat pump like in the winter months? And can we really be confident? that is gonna keep us warm in our colder climate. Uh, sure, Margaret. The uh, heat pumps with our experience, uh, I do have one at my home as well. Um, and I'm, we're using it 99% of the time. Uh, we do have backup heat that'll kick in if it's extremely cold, but it is a cold weather, uh, low ambient heat pump. So um, it really doesn't have a whole lot of uh, issues uh, in most years. The uh, comfort level uh, for those of us who have been in Chicago for a little while, um, boilers are extremely comfortable when you walk into a house in most cases uh, and people who have them and they really like the comfort from them. Uh, when you have a, uh, a variable capacity heat pump, uh, you're going to get similar uh, feeling in the home. It's going to be a little quieter, um, actually quite a bit quieter. 
the uh, temperature is more even throughout the home because rather than wanting to come on and heat to a temperature and shut off and let the temperature you know fall again before the furnace kicks in, the uh, heat pump kind of maintains that uh, nice even uh, heating. Uh, additionally, the you're, you're not using anything as far as combustion air or anything like that. You know, if you have a, a high efficiency furnace, most of the time you shouldn't have to worry about whether or not you have combustion air uh, for coming from the home. It should be coming from outside. But uh, a lot of folks who have non-condensing furnaces, uh, it does pull your already uh, heated air from your home and uses that for combustion. Um, so that is a little bit of an energy draw as well when they moved that way. Uh, we we uh, really advocate for heat pumps because they have gotten so, uh, they're, they're, they work extremely well. It's really, without having seen one, we actually have a showroom here at our shop so people can come out and take a look at them and see a demonstration of how they work. Um, it, it, it help, it's very helpful when you can feel how warm the air is, how how, how comfortable everything is. Uh, humidity levels are not as affected as much, um, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, our house is a uh, 1989 home and uh, we've not really done a whole lot of upgrades just yet, some extra insulation in the attic. Um, but uh, otherwise it, it does very well. I think it's a, a fantastic option for really any home. Let's talk about factors a little bit. Um, we had a question from Mark Benson about not being able to find a contractor a few years ago and maybe even hearing from some um you know that they wouldn't they wouldn't even entertain it with him so i'm sure he wishes he'd he'd known about you um then but how how should folks go about finding a contractor to install a heat pump well i think uh finding the in the area you know different areas of the country it's different manufacturers are more prevalent um so getting a hold of the manufacturers for the type of equipment that you're looking to uh, have installed I think you'll get very good uh, information from them because they tend to know the local uh, areas, the, just the distributors and the suppliers. They're going to know who's doing the uh, purchasing of that type of equipment. And, uh, you know, if it's something that you run on a regular basis, I really, right now, that's the best way I could say. And then, you know, do a, a good evaluation of the company that you're uh, looking at potentially having it, having had it done in your home. Uh, sometimes there's partnerships and, it doesn't really work out as well with, uh, you know, a builder or that sort of thing, but uh, finding someone who does what it is you're looking for. Thanks. And I see in the chat, um, Tom Bassadilly says that ComEd has a contractor list as well. I'm not clear if that's about weatherization or heat pumps um, specifically. There was another question, I think, to Graham about where to find the trade allies. Maybe these are the same, but Graham, if you have a, a link or something that you'd want to drop in, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can look for that uh, in a second. Um, People's Gas, North Shore, uh, ComEd's website, and then NICOR's website. NICOR uh, will have the, well, they'll all have the trade allies list, but I can drop that link in there. Um, I just want to piggyback a little bit on the question of what to expect for the winter. There's two important things uh, that I think everyone should know who has uh, dedicated electric uh, for their heating system in the wintertime is that their bills are going to be higher. Uh, and the, they'll, that'll be offset by some savings in the summer because of the efficiency. But the, in our experience, all electric homes in the winter are going to be more expensive. The second thing that I would say uh, is that it's absolutely essential that if you're looking at going to an all electric heating system in the wintertime that you make sure that you have a mechanical engineer do that could be the HVAC contractor but do manual JDNS calculations to make sure that the system is designed efficiently and appropriately. Um, sometimes some loads are left out sometimes the capacity might not be where it's supposed to be, um, but that's vital to having the system work as intended. And Graham, just to clarify, you're, you're pointing out that in the winter, a bill might be higher versus the gas alternative. And that's assuming no solar, no demand flexibility, right? That's just kind of apples to apples. 
forgive me, I, we probably have a national audience here in Chicago. Electricity costs a little bit more than gas. And in our experience, uh, those electricity bills are going to be higher. Yeah, uh, uh, when you compare apples to apples. Right, so potential to lower those bills then if you're able to add solar or add demand flexibility and or storage to that, to the, to the puzzle. Um, I wanted to get Joe and Bob in because I know Sean talked a lot about the panel, um, about kind of demand management. Can you all talk about in the local context, you know, where, where people should start? How do they figure out, you know, yeah, where to, where to start with their panel and kind of what the options are given that? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was muted there. I don't know if Joe was about to chime in. Joe, were you, were you chiming in? All right, I guess I'll address You're this. Good, Bob, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, so there's, there's a couple things that come up in this conversation. Um, one is, you know, the, the first thing, and Sean had a great slide on um, using a, uh, you know, the, the span panel for demand management is one thing. Um, I noticed in the chat, there's some questions here about, how Joe and I feel about the uh, the splitter devices too. I'll address that in here as well. Um, but really the, the first thing you need to look at is what the capacity of your electrical service is. There are some modifications we can make with, with load, load management to make a hundred amp panel work. But if we're looking at electricity for our heating source, um, unless if you're trying to retrofit an existing HVAC system, there's a really good chance that it may require a panel upgrade, just like adding an electric vehicle would be at this point as well, unless you're uh, just using the 120 volt charger that comes with the vehicle. So there's probably a good chance there. But the other thing we have to remember is it's not just the electrical service itself. It is all the wiring inside the home. And when we start talking about older homes, there may be some issues there where we might be uh, adding too much usage or amperage on the circuits that are there. We, we see a lot of older homes where they have one circuit for the entire kitchen. Well, if you make that kitchen electric, that's not going to work. So we're, we're going to have to have some, uh, some upgrades that are done. That'll definitely add some cost, but then we'd hope that those costs are offset with the savings of moving to all electric in the future there. Um, to get to the, the chat question um, about, about the, the splitters, I think that really depends on the product. The one that uh, Sean mentions and is in his document is UL listed. That's very important. A lot of these electrical devices that you could buy on Amazon or other things are not. And that means they have not been third party evaluated for their safety. And there may be concerns there in the future. And the last thing we want to hear is another electrical fire due to uh, products that are not listed and labeled for their use being utilized. Um, but also pay attention to the appliances you're powering because some electric vehicle chargers do require a dedicated circuit and it's in their language, it's in their, their installation specs, and it would be a code violation to then use a splitter device sharing that with another appliance. Yeah, and just to, just to add to that, Bob, with Bob talking about um, uh, making sure that something is UL listed, making sure that something's compatible with the National Electrical Code and potentially your own municipality. So throughout Illinois, um, different municipalities will adopt what code they're on for the National Electrical Code. It's not statewide adoption. So it could be a different a, um, addition of the code, a different year um, in your area. And also uh, municipalities might be adopting their own uh, permitting and regulations that, are, that would go on top of the National Electrical Code, um, specific, specifically when we start talking about solar or energy storage. So being you know, being aware of that, having a contractor assess that, who can navigate that and is well versed in that is definitely helpful. So you don't spend um, spend money in areas where it's not going to be permitted, it's not going to pass an inspection, uh, is important. Important point. Could you two or or anyone, but maybe specifically Joe and Bob, talk a little bit about what someone could expect in terms of costs for potential electrical work? I think it's one thing, you know, folks are kind of like, I, I'm, I can wrap my head around a new um, heating system, right? I know I need to save for that. Same thing with the stove, you know, I can get on Home Depot and look around at what that's going to cost me. But like, what are we talking about here? If, if I have to have an electrician come out and, you know, look at my circuits and kind of advise me on this, and then what, what's it going to cost me to kind of do, do the whole upgrade for my panel? What should people expect? 
So largely with any of these conversations, it depends is going to be a, a theme in it. And that's unfortunate, but it's true because depending on the house, depending on what needs to be done is going to affect those costs. So if you have, um, you know, a, a house that does not have conduit in it and you have to open up the walls in order to get wiring and get conduit through to the areas in which you're going to be adding this equipment, you have added costs, right? So if you have conduit in place already and you can pull a new line in there, then you're able to save some money there. Um, so you're going to be looking at probably having a contractor come in and depending on the scope of the work, either giving you an hourly rate that they're going to be able to estimate how long it's going to take, how many hours it might take, um, or give you a quote on something for a larger project. You know, if someone's adding some things in the basement, they might give you a quote or you can do an hourly thing. When you come to a panel upgrade, a service upgrade, you're probably going to want to look at a quote and, um, and compare that with a couple of contractors. So you know that you have a, a, a good number there. Um, one of the things that we recommend is be weary of the lowest number and uh, be weary of the highest number. And somewhere in the middle is where people generally have done their homework and research and know what it's gonna cost and be able to save you money as well. Bob, if you wanna jump in on any specific costs that you might, might wanna comment on. Yeah, I mean, Kind of, kind of what I've known from my experience going to a 200 amp panel, which would probably be required going from 100 to 200 in uh, the Chicago area, it might cost around $2,000 for that work, but that's only a portion of it, as Joe said. Um, one of the biggest problems we have is in Chicago itself with the older housing stock. If we still have plaster walls, that's going to really complicate any rewiring, um, removal of knob and tube and some of the older wiring methods that are no longer code compliant. Can, can actually add some cost quite a bit. Um, so new construction is always, always easier to do this. And uh, so, so one thing that can happen or one thing you can do to save money is not disturb the existing wiring and just anything that you're adding, have that be done separately. You know, new conduit, conduit installed for those purposes, leaving all the existing wiring intact, as long as it's not a code violation or fire hazard. Uh, but one thing I, I did not bring up in mind, sorry to uh, uh, bring this up too, is, you know, where we, we see this is great and we're going to get, you know, better air quality. We're going to have, you know, more efficiency and we're going to have, you know, more resilient homes if you incorporate ener energy storage and renewables into these projects. But we do have to keep in mind what's going to happen with the ComEd infrastructure. If everyone decides to go electric, there will be some issues with the, the distribution lines that run through our alleys right now. Um, you know, the same thing is happening right now with electric vehicle adoption, more people adding and charging at the same time. If they're charging during a day, it can actually overrate the, the transformers that are on the poles. So there's, there will be some significant infrastructure work on the ComEd side that really will be required to make this uh, uh, viable for everyone to switch to all electric. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. That's actually maybe my last prepared question had to do with um, kind of backup, so for a homeowner for resiliency, um, but thinking about the grid too, and I think Sean is encouraging us all to think of EVs as a potential, you know, storage solution and backup solution. Um, but Bob, I might pass that back to you and then get get Mike in here as well. How should people be thinking about this issue of backup at home, but also grid resiliency? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so adding renewables to the grid at the distributed level, which would be the homeowner or building, benefits the grid as a whole. So the more energy we're, we're putting on the grid at our points of usage are, bene are benefiting everyone. So our utilities tend to support this, at least in this region of the country. Um, but when we get into resiliency issues, we, we do have to understand that if, a, if there is no energy storage with a new renewable energy system, it will shut down if the grid is down as well. So we would have no on-site generation during a power, out, power outage also. So that's where batteries come in. And Sean is correct, you know, to bring up the Ford F-150 and other EVs that are moving towards vehicle to X or vehicle to grid uh, capabilities that will, I mean, they are essentially 100 kilowatt hour mobile batteries right there. Um, but we don't want to use all of that energy too, because we still would need that for transportation as well. So maybe we would dedicate through load management, 50% of the vehicle's capacity could be used for backing up loads in the home while we still have that transportation range that we may need if we have to evacuate in, in extreme scenarios. So you don't want to use all of your stored energy there. Um, when it comes 
do home-based storage like the Tesla Powerwall or Generac or some of these other uh, uh, um, companies out there, whole home backup tends to not be the best solution for most people. You don't need to back up your vacuum cleaner in case of an outage or you know some of these uh, electrical, your hair dryer or uh, loads that are not essential. So there will be some rewiring that be required to get the critical loads, which would be some of these electric heating sources or well pumps or things like that, sump pumps in case of storms, medical equipment in the home, types things like that that will have to be brought into a critical load panel that would then be backed up with the energy storage. So it will take some rewiring work, but it can be done easily. I think a kind of an ideal that we're moving towards, and I'm saying like in Louisiana, where the solar microgrid of, of low-income housing, is, it's in LinkedIn right now. It's like, hey, look, these people are getting to live in their homes safely right now. Now I'm supporting a number of developments around California and also one in Maryland that are trying to find ways to let their people shelter in place in these apartments. And so one of the strategies is bringing vehicles in that's definitely on the table and also the strategy of having batteries. And then the third one is having a solar array that powers up the battery and that's the critical loads that um, Bob was just mentioning that you say, well, in the winter time, I'll produce this much energy it, with the least amount of sunshine. And so I need to size my critical loads for kind of indefinite survival at that lower level. And we try to pair like worst case scenario with worst case scenario and make sure that we're keeping people safe um, and then you know, decide which circuits should go in. And it seems like putting in the span, if your circuits are already set up and isolated in a way that you can choose which things with existing circuits, the span is an example of a panel and there are others that can help you choose which circuits stay on when everything, when all the power goes out. So you can, depends on how your place is wired, you know, but for a retrofit there, at least there's options that are lower cost that might present themselves and there's options that are higher cost. But solar, battery, partly car, <laughs> you know, give yourself as much resiliency as you can afford, you know, get, get on the table as quick as you can. Back up the backup, right? Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, like the space shuttles and such, they have three backups. You know, Tesla is right. they drive around a three three different circuits for all the critical circuits for you know keeping the, the AI driver going. Yeah, back up. I wanted to see if if Mike, if you had anything to add. You mentioned I think you have a gas uh, backup system. Should people be thinking about keeping their gas? Should they think about electric resistance that can be integrated maybe into the heat pump itself? Can you address some of those questions? Yes, uh, I do have a gas furnace. Uh, when we install gas equipment, we do want to do the highest efficiency. So we're using the minimal amount. Um, that was where I was kind of talking a little bit earlier with non-condensing furnaces. You should always have a heat pump, but definitely if you have a non-condensing furnace because you can avoid using it uh, most of the time. Uh, as far as backup, we've, you know, like I said, we've done several of the systems that are primarily all electric. So they would have resistance electric heat backup. Uh, very, very uh, seldom do that, does that turn on, um, but it is there. You wanna have it when it's really cold outside, you wanna be able to use that. Um, also some equipment does have uh, reheat. I know Sean had mentioned Nate Adams. He's a big proponent of reheating so you don't have to use a dehumidifier. Uh, with the electric heat on the uh, air handling equipment. Um, for us in Chicago, uh, being a residential guy primarily, the biggest kickback you will get when you hear people talking about heat pumps when I talk to them uh, is, hey, you know, gas, I know it's gonna work. And they've had it for many, many years and yeah, they've been told heat pumps don't work. And so it's getting across that hurdle, uh, you know, and explaining to them how it works. Again, with our stuff here, we want people to be able to come in and see how well it is, uh, how well it works and what it feels like. It doesn't feel like cold air, like you know, resistant of heat blowing out at 18, 20 degree difference. The heat bulb actually feels very, very warm because the blower speed is, is typically lower. Um, so I think when it comes to backup, I'm not opposed. I know this is the green energy, Illinois green. So it's like, I try not to say a whole lot about gas, but there, that's for us as a population, that's a big uh, a big kickback. So if you can offer gas and then they realize they really don't have to use it that much, if ever in years, um, you know, kind of like we had our stuff last year and our air quality went up drastically because people weren't doing a lot of the things they were doing prior uh, while we were all at home. 
you know, and at that point we were actually in our homes more uh, using more of that stuff. So if we're able to get rid of some of the, the gas that we're using a majority of the time for heating purposes, I think uh, that's def a definite plus. I put out there that propane has a global warming potential of three and methane in natural gas is at 82, 84. And so the, the fact that most gas is leaked at about 3% means that if you are burning methane, you have the same amount of carbon impact from the combustion as you do from the leakage. So it's really a doubling up that's out there in the IPCC reports, you know, like somewhere between 25 and 40% of our climate change is the methane leakage. So even just shifting people to propane for their backup fuel is a pretty significant move if, if it's possible, just from the climate change perspective. Um, but there's also when the power goes out, as you know, like the fans stop working, and I think that having an electric support is necessary for gas or electricity. So might as well just go with a high quality electric product. There was one that I wanted to, oh shoot, did I close it? There, um, are you guys familiar with, with um, the kind of heat pumps that are, one second, uh, okay, like a PTAC, but not a PTAC that's a, the standard type, but the kind that's a cold climate. Oh, there we go. I figured out where, how to, to zoom it in. So one more second. I want to ask about this product if you've seen this before. Here we go. This. Have you seen one of these wall heat pumps that has two ducts that come through? Like one duct comes in, the other one goes out? Because these are cold climate heat pumps for retrofits. They're 120 volt devices. This thing here. Right? So you, it's, it's like 1100 watts or something. You can stick it into every room. We're starting to do this as retrofits um, in houses and apartments in California where like they're really funding rapid electrification. This has come out as a standout product and you abandon the duct system if it's there and you just start setting up so every room is in its own zone with like a, a, a 10,000, 12,000 BTU heat pump that's cold climate with a little electric resistance element also in it. So it has its own backup for negative 10 degree Fahrenheit kind of stuff. So, um, is it at all, have you bumped into this? It's out of Italy. <laughs> all right, well, there you go. It's, a, it's called the EFOCA, E-P-H-O-C-A. The EFOCA HPAC 2.0. It's a heat pump, air conditioner, cold climate. Uh, Olympia is a competitor. Um, they make the Olympia Ma Maestro. And these are both cold climate. So Mike, to your point, people think that heat pumps don't work. And they didn't before they had computers, which started in 2000. And when I try to do my heat pump talk with people, and this is kind of this, like, hey, hey, y'all. In 2000, they started adding computers to heat pumps. And that's what makes them go below freezing. Um, they accelerate, the computer accelerates the, the direct, the direct uh, current, the DC electricity that's going to the compressor. It's a DC device. And it controls the amount of electricity going to the pumps and the compressor devices. And it speeds it up when it gets cold. And it slows it down as it gets warm and it always maintains a very high efficiency. But most importantly, you can go down to negative 31 Fahrenheit now because of the addition of the computer. Plus like reheating of the of de-icing, get some de-icing technology. But it's a new day. You know, we've had 20 years of computerized heat pumps and, and they make it so heat pumps do work. Um, and it's true, yeah, single speed heat pumps like they still use in the South don't work well in the North. Um, but they're cheap in the south. We need to use cold climate computerized heat pumps. Yeah. Hey John, let's get to some of our questions in the chat. Um, we just had one come in about conventional smart thermostats like Ecobee or Nest. Will they work with the heat pumps that have been discussed here today, or is a proprietary thermostat required? Mike, my experience is that they all work with it, but what, what's your take? It's going to depend on what equipment you're you're dealing with and what kind of performance you're trying to get. Uh, typically, the uh, communicating equipment that has a proper pro, pro, proprietary uh, controller is uh, is going to be able to achieve a little higher efficiency uh, out of the equipment. Uh, but uh, you can use it. I know a lot of the ductless products have adapters, so you can use Ecobee. Um, and you know, several other types of thermostats, really any of them, the third party you want. Uh, so it really just depends on what you want to do. Um, there are some functions that you would lose uh, using a thermostat like that. 
if you're dealing with inverter type of system, especially. I would just piggyback on that and say one of the options that you might lose would be adjusting the fan speed. So if you're if you're having if it, if the system gets installed installed and the diagnostics are not done to balance the system and make sure it's operating appropriately once it's installed. So commissioning the system uh, and you install a third party thermostat or control, you may lose the ability to do that. And so you have to swap back out the control in order to change it, in order to diagnose it, in order to fix it. So just keep that in mind. Thanks, Graham. I think our next question is actually to you. Um, can you recommend a national database where we could check to have building ventilation, heat airflow diagnostic testing done, not a whole house energy test, just the present state of ventilation? Yeah, I saw this question. I, I, I don't know of a national database. I apologize. Um, I would say that testing and balancing uh, companies are all over the country can do heating and cooling, uh, testing and balancing, um, testing the soffit to the ridge ventilation. I don't know, I'll be honest. Uh, I mean, if, I don't know if a flow hood would work there. I'm, I'm, you know, I specialize in testing the airflow of typically mechanical systems in the house and the, obviously the, the air leakage of the entire building. Um, I've never tested soffit to ridge or attic ventilation. I'm not sure what tool would do that. Sorry. Thanks. Anybody else want to take that one? I've never heard of testing an attic. I don't know how to do that. I would say that um, if you don't have mold on the underside of your uh, sheathing and the attic from a building perspective, you're okay. Um, and, uh, and I would also say that, uh, you know, unvented or, or vented is a, is a hot debate over the years, but you, you can have both. So sorry, I can't be of more help there. Not a problem. Um, let's see, Sean, we had a question specifically to you. Is it possible to quantify a per person residential energy consumption that can be supported by renewables only? Yeah, um, well, there's, okay, there's a lot of answers to this question. But so we've studied about 500 apartments second by second, they're all electric to all their loads. And then since they're affordable housing, we knew how many people lived in each one of them, how much they made, how old were their kids. So I can say that in every given day, identical households will have a difference of one to 10 in their consumption behavior. And that those two households that are at a one to 10 scale are consistently that way. But at the end of the year, it's a one to four ratio between lowest and highest consumers. So first of all, there's a huge amount of diversity in the population of how people live their lives in identical houses. It's huge. It's, it's just outrageously big. Then once you get into these averages, you'd say, well, one person in one apartment with not very much HVAC load, so super insulated, like Passive House or you know, Coastal California, one of those, one person uses 13 kilowatt hours. In that apartment, the second person only adds one kilowatt hour more. So it's not 13 a day, it's 14. And the third person adds only one more. It's just one for all the way up to one people to six people. It's just one, one extra kilowatt hour. So there's a lot of energy savings from living together is one of the things I noticed. <laughs> the first person uses a lot of energy, everyone else not so much. The more people in the house, the less it is per person. Um, so, you could say like, hey, if you had a really insulated house or you didn't worry that it was hot or cold, then you could keep the whole rest of the thing going um, at on an average of 13 kilowatt hours to 19 kilowatt hours a day, depending upon how many people. But it, since the diversity is so wide in there, sometimes it's better to say like, I wanna keep my food cold and I, and I want to be able to turn on the air conditioner if there's a heat wave and keep the, like get an electric blanket at least for myself to stay warm if this place is actually super cold and everything's frozen. Um, and, and so you, and how much solar is produced that day, there's one fourth as much energy in the winter coming out of the sun as there is in the summer, peak to peak, summer solstice to winter solstice. It's a four to one ratio. So once again, like you, you study the worst moment, what happens in the worst moments, oh, it gets super cold in your house, the polar vortex, and then 
what do you need to stay alive while this gets fixed over the next few days? And, and since a Tesla Powerwall is 13 kilowatt hours, and that kilowatt hour costs twice as much to install as getting a Nissan Leaf or a Toyota, whatever, I think all the different electric vehicles, the car battery, that's a half as expensive battery and you can drive it around. So I encourage people to go get your EV, get your vehicle to building charger, and then you'll have four to six times as much power available during a power outage. And you can decide if you wanna drive away to a hotel or if you wanna stay home. <laughs> all right, we all have our homework from Sean here. Um, Sean, Jason in the chat says that Tatum Engineering in New York has done some demonstrations on those PTEC heat pumps that you were showing earlier. And then Jason is also asking a question about outside of these kind of big uh, pieces of electric equipment, how have plug loads changed in the last several years versus projections? And how should electrification efforts plan for plug loads going forward? Do we need to plan on more consumption? Maybe I'll throw that to Bob, because Bob, you were kind of addressing this idea of, you know, if everyone electrified today, we'd have a problem on our hands. Um, so how, how can we think about Jason's question about plug loads and how they might have been changing in, in very recent times? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the question right now to make sure I'm addressing it. Can I, can I toss in there? Having studied plug loads, it's one of my specialties. I can say that you can get one of those tier one power strips and cut the amount of energy used in a room that's not needed by about half. It can be only 25%, it can be 75%, right? Depends upon the room, depends upon the Game Boy, et cetera. But roughly half, it can be just turning off things that's your total energy consumption for that room. The, the question of how have plug loads changed, the, the disappearance of plasma TVs has made a big difference. You know, like those used to be this 1300 kilowatt hour per year device. And now everyone's moved to screens that are laptops and are fairly energy efficient media screens. So the main users of energy at this point are like large speakers and home office supplies like printers and things like that. Um, and so generally the loads have actually gone mostly down for most households, except to 3000 square foot households and above. Because as soon as you get into alarms and home energy management systems, which are mostly a luxury, not actually saving energy, um, then you have a much larger plug loads. Studying like Palo Alto, Silicon Valley area where like people getting into larger homes have stupid amounts of toys and it's just massive. So it's like this behavior change at 3000 square feet versus most people who are 500 to you know 3,000 square feet homes. So mostly, most people have gone down. Rich people have gone through the roof with their toys. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to the, the way we determine the plug loads when it comes into sizing our electrical services is based upon our square footage. It actually gets tied into the lighting load for the, for the structures themselves. So it depends on occupancy, how many uh, VA or, or volt amps that's going to be per square foot. And you know, there's been some discussion on this because our if, if the plug loads get tied into the, and I'm not talking about the dedicated kitchen outlets here and circuits there, I'm talking about the standard plug loads. Um, the lighting loads primarily have gone down over time as we've moved from you know incandescent to CFL to LED. So you would think that that, that VA value should go down with sizing our electrical services, but the fact is we're plugging more things in as well. So we tend to see a balance right now where there hasn't, we don't see a need to increase the amount for plug loads in our electrical services, but we also don't see the need to reduce that number based on the lighting demand getting lower. Thank you. So I think um, given the time, we might just do one final thought from each of you. Um, so if there's one thing you want people to take away or think about when they're telling their family about this exciting webinar that they're on today. Um, what would that be? Um, so maybe I will start with Graham. What's kind of your one takeaway that you want folks to leave with here tonight? Um, uh, gas, <laughs> I can't remember which conference I was at, but uh, one of the keynote speakers put it eloquently that said, um, 
and uh, this is terrible because I'm not citing my source, but he said, you had the option to have uh, a pit bull in the room or not have a pit bull in the room, which would you choose? You know, like a pit bull is a terrible example, a, uh, a, a man eating monster uh, or man and woman eating monster. Um, and that would be gas. So if you have the choice and you could live without it, you would probably choose not to have it uh, in your house. Um, so I would say let's start starting to think about not only uh, the the implication of of money and and uh, sustainability on the on the world scope, but also indoor health uh, and air quality uh, all around. Electricity is what we're moving towards. Uh, it's a good idea. Thanks, Graham. Let's do Bob and then Joe. Final thoughts. Yeah, I guess uh, what I would say is anything we can do is a good thing. You know, paying attention to how you use power um, and look at our entire, I mean, if we're talking about moving away from, from gas and moving towards electric, um, just don't just pay that bill, pay attention to how many kilowatt hours you're using, how you're using that electricity. Are there things that you're, uh, you're powering up that don't need to be powered at any given time? Because we can design an electrical system around anybody's usage. But if we want everyone to benefit from this, we need to all be more efficient in the way we approach our usage. And uh, thanks, Graham, for clearing that up because I was going to say that I would like to be in the room with the pit bull. So thanks for clearing that up, and making it a monster. Bad example. <laughs> Terrible example. Um, I, I would just uh, uh, leave it at um, you know, a lot of the things that Bob and I focus on are are training next generation of energy workers with uh, renewable energy. And uh, this conversation is great because we really have to be addressing the efficiencies and energy usage and consumption prior to designing those solar systems, those battery backup systems, because this is where people can save money um, first and foremost, and then save money over the years because they have they use less electricity, less energy, and are more responsible with it. Um, I'd also like to encourage people to um, make sure that systems are installed by professionals and. Um, you know, safe, safely, safely done. No, no people who know what they're doing. Um, when we get into solar and energy storage, we're adding um, power systems to the homes, right? That have have risks, have um, safety risks if not installed properly. That could either be apparent right away or years later. Um, specifically with energy storage and solar, because you're you're adding, you know, whole another power source to the home. So uh, just you know, it's a very exciting time to be going this route, and uh, at the same time, be careful and. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Joe. Let's hear from Mike and then Sean can take us home. I think uh, just following on our conversation today, um, definitely moving away from gases is a key uh, thing for everyone. Um, and uh, I think to make some changes in your home, if we, you know, when you're talking about existing stuff, like a lot of the stuff that Sean's uh, topics talked about today, um, Simple things like uh, using a portable uh, cooktop, like I've done in my home. I'm just trying to get my wife to go full bore and let me get the, the full induction stove, uh, see how nice it, it cooks. But, uh, you know, doing heat pumps, uh, even if you're still using gas, there's people who still have uh, gas uh, dryers and things like that. It doesn't mean you can't. Uh, incorporate a lot of the things that are going to be a big benefit for everyone moving forward and eventually get the gas out of their home as they replace those appliances as well. Great. Great. Sean? Like, I, I also have adopted a process of getting rid of gas. Just got the electric vehicle a few months ago. Finished. Right? But it was a 10-year process of, of doing it on purpose. I encourage you all to like make your plan, work on it as quickly as you can, and to put it out there, just technically, if we were to electrify everyone's homes now, what would happen would be a degradation of our infrastructure by about 15 years, from 30 years to 15 years. I've consulted a lot of electric utility level folks, like what if we did it now with efficiency, not just throw a whole bunch of resistance on the grid, but you know, do it with the efficiency, could, what would happen? And they said it would age our transformers, it would age a lot of different pieces of equipment we'd have. So we could do it, but we would, take off 15 years of our life. Okay, that might be a fair deal. But that just considering uh, my mother-in-law died in, in one of the first climate change fires in California is the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. So that was 2017. And that was the, the fall that I completely 
lost my shit and just did it. I'd spent the money I didn't have, got a loan, you know, credit card, that kind of just the small stuff. But I did it because it really it hit me emotionally um, that what the stakes were. So it just, you know, it's climate change has, has hit like one in three households in the United States this summer with either a flood or a serious heat wave. Um, and all the scientists are saying this is a, a code red moment for, for humanity to make some choices. So I encourage you to go as quickly as you can and to support Com Edison in doing direct installations where they do what's called the, the, the meter repays. You essentially, they, you pay off the debt off of meter. So you can sell your house. Someone still has the same meter. They continue to pay off the debt for the HVAC and domestic hot water system. We got replaced directly by Com Edison so that we can do this quickly because they have bonds. They have huge amounts of capital to invest in increasing their electric load. They can raise money to do it. And, and so that's the most powerful entity along with the federal government that actually could rapidly solve um, climate change from buildings. Thanks, John. Thanks for sharing. I think Katie wants to say one last final word. Well, thank you guys all so much. Um, Thank you to our whole team of experts, uh, Mike, Sean, Bob, Joe, um, Graham, and thank you, Margaret, for hosting and fielding all of these questions um, and, and helping to organize this program with us. It was really wonderful. Um, I know that um, all of our contact information is going to get shared in a follow-up email, as well as the recording to today's webinar. Um, any of the links we shared in the chat today will also include in that follow-up email. So if you didn't get enough today, you can keep re-watching and clicking the links and learning more watching more videos. So thank you guys for going um, through all of this with us today. Um, if you'd like to start your all electric um, new construction or retrofit process journey, um, we also have a green pro directory on our green belt home tour website. Um, we'll share that link um, in the chat and also um, in the follow up email as well. And then join us next week um, for our final webinar in this year's green belt home tour webinar series, um, homeowners discussing how to green your home. So we have three different homeowners um, all doing different levels of uh, um, retrofits on their existing homes. And they're gonna talk us through their story and why they've prioritized those projects and kind of the process they went going through them. So you can register for free um, and uh, hopefully you will. Um, our website, um, greenbelthometour.org has a lot of other great resources for homeowners. So we hope you check it out. Um, and thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, have a good afternoon and thank you again to all of our presenters.